are secrets the government doesn't want you to know about. Terrifying secrets that have been meticulously covered up for decades. Phenomena so bizarre and disturbing that if the general public only knew, they would stay out of our national forests. In fact, Mount Rainier National Park has been one of the epicenters of this strange and frightening mystery. Mysteries that should not exist in this reality. The real questions are what dimensions did these things come out of and why is the government covering up their existence? You won't want to miss this one. One night, in the early 1990s, an 18-year-old man, Brian Canfield, was busy traveling and driving in his pickup truck to Camp One, which is a small community right near Lake Kapowson in the Mount Rainier foothills. And it was roughly about 9.30 p.m. when suddenly, and without any warning, Brian's vehicle abruptly stopped in the road. Now, Brian was very puzzled by this because he had actually been accelerating just fine the entire Entire time and his car showed no signs of failure yet the engine completely failed him leaving him stranded in the middle of the road now Brian would try several times to try and restart his truck but nothing seemed to work and so he's desperate he's frustrated and so he starts getting out of his truck into the small patch of road and there's actually a bit of the road in front of him that's illuminated by his headlights and so he's just sitting there trying to think of what to do. I mean, he's gotta do something, but then something catches Brian's attention. A large figure that seems to be coasting down in front of him. And at first he thought it was just an oversized bird, but he dismissed that possibility the moment it landed. Whatever it was, it was heavy enough to send a large plume of dust flying into the air. Now, it took a moment for Brian to process what his eyes were showing him, but there in the middle of the road stood a nine foot tall beast, and it was covered head to toe in fur, which oddly enough, took on this blue tint in his headlights, and it kind of made it shimmer, kind of like a peacock's feathers. And then this thing's fingers twitched and its wings began to unfold, and Brian then saw that its wings were as wide as the road. And then it turned its head, looked back at Brian, and then just started kind of flapping its wings, which by the way, the air caused by the creature's takeoff was so strong that it actually shook Brian's pickup truck. And so the very last glimpse he got of this thing is that it was heading in the direction of Mount Rainier. Now, just a few minutes after this thing flew off, Brian's truck suddenly started. And so he gets back in and he takes off as fast as he could, eager to put distance between himself and whatever it was he had just encountered. Now, in fact, Brian was actually interviewed by journalist C.R. Roberts just days after the sighting where he would tell Roberts what this thing looked like in detail. And he described as it stood up in front of his truck that it stood on a set of feet complete with long, sharp claws of a raptor. And then its eyes were yellow and shaped like a piece of pie with pupils like half a moon. And the mouth was pretty large, white teeth, no fangs, and the face was kind of like that of a wolf. And it was standing there just staring at Brian like it was resting, like it didn't know what to think. Now, Brian was obviously terrified and it raised the hair all over his body, but he remains that he didn't feel threatened. He just felt out of place, as if this thing was looking right at him in a deep stare, as if it was looking through him and it stood perfectly still. And it did this for several long minutes. Now, Brian would conclude in his interview that he would be willing to put his life on the line. This is how serious he was about telling the truth. Now, C.R. Roberts was very impressed by Bryant during the interview. He thought he was a very genuine man. Roberts detected no signs of drug or alcohol abuse or any form of deception during the interview, and all of Bryant's acquaintances had confirmed of his good character. Now, Sandra, which was Bryant's mother, even told that her son was very visibly upset by what he had seen, 
and come to find out that later on, the trauma was so great for Brian that he confessed that he wished he had never seen this thing. And in fact, Brian's account was so sincere and genuine that it would go on to be featured in the April 24th, 1994 edition of Tacoma, Washington's News Tribune. Now, interestingly, later in 1994, Butch Whitaker, an amateur aviator and liquor store owner, swore that his airplane was actually paced in the sky in broad daylight by this enormous winged being. Now, it soared with him above Mount Rainier for a few moments before it would change its trajectory and would just fly off in the distance. And so Butch had no idea what to make of it, but this was far from over. Now, four years later, another witness claimed to have seen one of these things, which was struck by a logging truck on an isolated road. And the witness would watch as the vehicle hit an obstruction, initially thought to be a large log or a stump, and would send it off the shoulder of the road to pretty much dangle precariously over the mountainside. Now, eager to rescue the driver from what would surely be a fatal slide downhill, the witness rushed to help, only to see that the truck had not struck a stump at all. Whatever it was, it was, it was just massive and weird, and the rescuer wasn't sure what to make of it. And it was in that moment that the rescuer realized this wasn't a log or a stump, it was actually some sort of alien looking animal. And as a matter of fact, when they would share the details about this, they explained that they would have to delete their email because they were scared the government was going to track them down in order to keep this all a secret as a part of a grand conspiracy. The entity that this rescuer described stood at about 15 feet in height and appeared hunched over in front of this person. And once it had taken to the skies, this person explained that it was around 30 feet in length and would go on to describe how unusually small the head was in comparison to the body, that the eyes were small and beady, and that its nose was purple and then it had pointed ears protruding from the top of the head. Now, as it took off and ascended, the rescuer thought that the wingspan was actually too tiny to carry this massive thing, but then saw that the wingspan actually expanded out like a good 30 or 40 feet. As if the description of this thing wasn't disturbing enough, the rescuer then described it having four sets of hands two large sets of claws that sat near the middle of the wings, very similar to that of a bat, and two hands attached to arms, attached to a body, just the way a human would. In fact, the rescuer described it looking like this horrific demonic cross between a very large bat and a man. Now, for me personally, seeing something that's 30 feet tall ascending into the sky would be absolutely horrific, but my question is if it was this large, wouldn't there have been other eyewitnesses? I mean, clearly this isn't just an isolated incident. And what's far more disturbing is that these sightings extend far beyond the reaches of Washington state. In fact, the mysterious bat-like entity that Brian Butch and the rescuer all described remains a mystery. In January of 1976, John and David Dot, minding their own business and just lost in casual conversation between the two, saw something fly down directly in front of them on the road. Now, this thing was so incredibly large that they were actually forced to stop their vehicle. As the seconds went by, they were able to somewhat accurately take in what it was they were seeing in front of them, and it terrified them and it scared them to such a degree they would throw their car in reverse in a mad scramble to try and retreat. And so within seconds after this large black mass, it just took off in the air and they could hear the massive wings just flapping and carrying on off in the distance. Now what David and John described seeing was an entity that had a wolf's head and large bat wings. The frame of this entity was anywhere between 8 to 10 feet tall and was just this hulking, massive figure. Unfortunately for John and David, this would only be one of many of the handful reports in the Rio Grande Valley at the time. Clearly, this entity isn't just bound to the Pacific Northwest because around the same time frame in Hidalgo County, Texas, 
a father and son were out enjoying the peaceful, beautiful early morning while they were out deer hunting together. And as these two were moving along the forest, this large black shape appears out of nowhere and just kind of swoops down and actually grabs the father and picks him up and starts to carry him away. Now, the son, thinking as quickly as he could, grabs his rifle and starts firing at this thing, completely uncaring if he even ends up hitting his father. He's trying to save his life. It's unclear as if he was able to actually hit this thing, but whatever it was that grabbed his dad, let him go. And so his father falls to the ground and it roughs him up pretty good. But fortunately, his father only suffered some broken ribs and a few scratches and not his own life. Now, he was not able to explain away that he was picked up and nearly carried off by some large bird. And if it wasn't for his son, well, he wouldn't be alive to tell the tale. And so just like the Pacific Northwest, Texas has been having this string of strange sightings of flying entities and humanoids that they can't explain. And this has been going on to such a degree that a report from 2005 would actually make it into the 2006 November issue of Fate Magazine. On the morning of June 23rd, 2005, Max Rodenfo in Lytle, Texas was just simply relaxing and taking it easy on his back porch early in the morning hours at about 2.30. He had already had a long day behind him and he was just trying to relieve himself from the stress. And so he's just sitting there enjoying a cigarette, listening to the calm sounds of the early morning around him. And however, something large and black began descending from the sky that would catch his attention. And so he stands up in reaction. He's trying to look a little closer to observe whatever this strange thing is. Now, the first thing that's going through his mind is that this is possibly a drone or maybe it's a plane, but he sees that whatever this is is actually growing nearer and nearer and he still can't make sense of what it is. Now, the way it's shaped or why it's moving the way it is just doesn't make sense. And he also doesn't hear any buzzing or noises or even humming sounds that you would typically hear with a drone or a small plane of some kind. And so at this point, he's completely baffled and it's continuously getting closer and closer. Now, at this point, it's roughly 100 feet away from him and he's thinking, OK, I know what this is. It has to be a glider of some kind. I mean, there's just no other explanation for it. And just as Max finished that trail of thought, this thing moves quickly, revealing its front side and this small little head that looks directly at Max with a pair of eagle-like eyes. And immediately, Max is taken aback and starts noticing all these horrific details. And as you can imagine being in this situation, what you're looking at is so strange. It's, it's like it's plucked out of an X-Files episode. I mean, it's practically impossible to ever forget it. This being had what appeared to be a canine head and he, he can make out these curled fingers at each fingertip, but didn't see any tail at all. And judging by the size and the overall frame and body structure, he would estimate that it was roughly six feet in length. Now, even though what he was seeing was strange, what it was doing to him was completely terrifying him. So he retreated in fear back into his house, locking his door and grabbing his gun. And so he decided to go in there and wait in case this thing had planned on landing and waiting for him to come outside. And after a short amount of time, he would go back out on his porch to look for it. But this mysterious animal was nowhere to be seen. So whatever this creature was, as it was heading directly towards Max, was actually sizing him up and could have potentially attacked him or worse, devoured him. Now, interestingly, the attributes that Max spoke about are very similar to the other stories in this episode that I'm going to be sharing with you, in addition to being very similar to what Brian, Butch, and the rescuer saw in the first part of the episode. Now, as far as the identity of the strange being that John and David saw in the middle of the road back in 1976, the entity that grabbed the father and dropped him after getting shot at, and the creature that had contemplating on eating Max early in the morning, all remains inconclusive. Years ago in Missoula, Montana, Nathaniel and his family lived a relatively peaceful life. And so at this time, Nathaniel was only five years of age and he had also younger and older siblings with him outside and they were playing. And, and on this particular day, 
He was just outside playing with his younger and older siblings around their very large open property, and he's actually on the back deck, and he actually decides to use his binoculars. And so, you know, he's just kind of just looking around for anything that stands out, and he's looking around, and he kind of stops because he sees something in the sky that's heading right in his direction. Now, immediately, this comes off as very odd to him because what he was seeing wasn't just one object, but actually several of them. And so he's straining to look through his binoculars and he's looking closer and closer and he thinks these are just large birds. And so he's looking and looking and these things are getting closer and closer. And then he was able to see these things for what they were. Now his gut, even at five years old, was screaming at him to run. And so he throws his binoculars down, grabs his younger siblings and his older ones and runs under a tree where they kind of just nose dive and they're sitting there huddled together hiding and they could hear and see these things just swooping right above them right over the tree overhead what nathaniel saw looked just like these grotesque flying gorillas very similar to goldar from the power rangers just you know minus the golden armor Interestingly, around mid-June in 2005, a French island resident, Bill, would have become entangled in one of the most bizarre and terrifying ordeals of his life. Now, Bill was the kind of man who actually liked having small talk with his neighbors and kept tabs on them just to see how they were doing with their life. It's something that's kind of a lost art that many people of the older generation did often. And through the course of conversation, he just kept hearing about how a lot of his close neighbors were being awoken in the middle of the night by strange sounds on the roof. Now, they would describe to Bill that it sounded like a large animal had climbed up there and was just making all these stomping sounds and dragging noises of all things. And so Bill thought this was very strange, especially considering that he was hearing this from several of his neighbors in this very small time frame. And he wasn't sure what to make of it, but then it continued to escalate. Now, during this time, many of the neighborhood animals, you know, like cats, dogs, you name it, also began vanishing without a trace, but specifically when they were out at nighttime. Now, some of these people told Bill that when they'd go to let their dog or cat outside at night, their animal would never come back inside. Even if they would keep calling their name, there was no sign of them. It's just as if they just vanished altogether. And so Bill himself was an animal lover. He had kids, he had a wife, he had two pets of his own. And so by about 10 days later, around the 25th of June, this is roughly in about a two week time span, both of his pets, along with many of his neighbors, would have just mysteriously vanished without a trace. And so things are starting to look really weird. And so it was around this time that Bill figured that he needed to take action and get to the bottom of all of this. So he had begun this nightly vigil on his back porch and the hopes to try and catch a glimpse of whoever was taking all the animals. Now that possibly this person, whoever they were and whatever their intentions were, had to have been the cause of all the strangeness over the past week or so. However, some of the things he experienced proved to him that this wasn't just a person. And so every single night he would go out there and he would sit and he would wait and he would wait and he would wait and he would never really notice anything out of the ordinary. I mean, sure, there were some times where the backyard light would flicker on in response to the motion sensor being triggered, but there was never really anything there. And during this same time while he was doing these nightly patrols in his backyard, he would also take notice of these strange lights in the sky that he couldn't explain as just airplanes. I mean, what they did and how they moved simply defied our realm of physics. And as the days continued to go on like this, he's like, this is crazy. There has to be some sort of connection to all of this. And so one evening, it begins just like usual, where it's getting later at night. He's getting ready to step out onto the porch and he began to see something off in the distance. What he saw, he couldn't exactly describe that great, but he just saw this large, strange shape moving down the base of this large tree. And he really took notice at how cautiously and how smoothly it moved. And then he continued watching it as it kind of slowly clambered its way up the playground equipment that his kids had been using. 
Now, as you can imagine from Bill's perspective, he's probably completely terrified because he can't explain what he's looking at, but it simply defies the laws of nature. I mean, think of all the ways that you would try to rationalize this as it's playing out in front of you. And because Bill is trying to crane his neck and look closer at whatever this strange being is, it suddenly seemed to snap in his direction as if in response to him looking at it, and it instantly took notice of Bill, or at least he thought it did because it looked in the exact direction of his house. Then, in response, it quickly scurries off into the darkness. Now, Bill's stomach completely soured at that point, and he just felt sick and queasy, and this persistent feeling like he wasn't supposed to see that just lingered over him like a dark rain cloud. It was as if whatever this was, was angry that it had been spotted. Well, just days before Bill had this experience, one of his other neighbors, Jim, who by the way was only like half a block away at most, was also outside on his porch one evening, smoking a cigarette and relaxing. It's something that most people do when they step outside at night to smoke a cigarette and he's kind of just lost in a trail of his own thinking and just watching the smoke drift off into the night sky and something steals his attention away. But it wasn't something that he could see, at least not right away. He could hear something, and it sounds incredibly strange for the setting and environment he's in. It sounded like something very large descended out of the sky and then landed in a nearby tree. Bam! He could hear something large land and these branches start creaking and breaking and bending as if they're under great stress by something very heavy that's now sitting on them. And now Jim is thinking to himself, what the heck is that? What is happening? This massive bird just landed in this tree. I gotta go check this out. And so he's trying to look out from his porch, you know, but he can't exactly see just because there's a lot of leaves and foliage and overgrowth. It is summertime and it's preventing him from seeing any further into the tree. So he decides to go ahead and get closer by stepping forward off the porch and over by the tree. And as he gets close, this large blur of a shape shoots out of the tree in the sky, lands on his roof, and within a second or so, it kind of just scuttles off and actually jumps off his roof onto the opposite side. Now at this point, Jim was just completely stunned by what he had saw and was extremely freaked out by whatever this large bird or creature was. And so Bill and Jim would eventually recount all of their experiences to the late paranormal author, Linda Godfrey, rest in peace. And it was here that Bill described to Linda that this thing kind of resembled Gollum from Lord of the Rings and the way it walked around on all fours and how it looked entirely hairless, but did not have any glowing eyes. It was probably no more than five feet tall at most. Its legs were longer than they should have been and its hands and feet were abnormally large. Now, you need to understand something. French Island, where this took place, isn't out in the boonies or in the middle of nowhere cut off from civilization. It's right near the college town of La Crosse in Wisconsin, which by itself has a pretty strong population of over 50,000 people, not to mention the larger metro area, which holds over 140,000 people and encompasses several smaller communities all around it. Well, on the evening of September 26, 2006, roughly six miles north of French Island, Wohali was a Cherokee man and his son were on their way back from a music rehearsal in La Crosse in their pickup truck. And Wohali's son at this point was behind the wheel as they would make their way home to Holman in Wisconsin. And it's also important to note here that Wohali had lived in this valley his entire life. And over the years, he'd seen some pretty strange things. I mean, after all, the Upper Mississippi River Refuge, which is the largest in the county, it hides a lot of strange things, but nothing could have prepared Wahali for what him and his son were about to experience. And so it was about 9.30 p.m. at night, and they turned onto Briggs Road, which is a rural road that would take them home. And so as they passed by this private shooting range, everything suddenly goes dark. And I mean darker than the surrounding shadows. And that's because something had flown directly towards their windshield, something so massive that it almost completely blotted out their entire field of view. And so both Wahali and his son just tense up. They don't know what this is. And they're sure that whatever this is coming at us, the impact is completely unavoidable. 
and in those fleeting moments, they were able to pick out a few troubling details, but the thing that was barreling toward them was so fast and riding the air currents on a pair of large, leathery bat-like wings that when they unfurled, they were wider than the pickup truck itself. I mean, perhaps as long as a dozen feet. In fact, the sighting was so clear that Wahali could make out the thing's ribcage as it dive-bombed their windshield. A collision was only avoided barely by Wahali's son's quick thinking, and so he swerves out of the way at the last minute, and the creature peels off into the sky, releasing this horrific high-pitched wail, and it just disappears in the countryside, gone for good behind a cluster of trees. Now, it wasn't until years later when Mahali would finally write a letter to Linda Godfrey and he would explain to her what this thing looked like in detail, that at the center of these strange appendages sat a body, thin and emaciated, and it was the size of an average human being, but yet covered with fur and proportioned almost like that of a bat. Dangling beneath were a set of feet were sharp claws. But the face was the worst of all, and it seemed a bit like a dog's head, you know, complete with pointed ears and a mouth bristling with long pointed teeth. But he also mentioned to Linda that it looked hungry and that he and his son were so completely terrified by this experience that they were both up all night long just sick as dogs. They get home, his son's vomiting at least six or seven times all throughout the night. He can't go to sleep. It was horrific. But the most terrifying aspect of this experience was how close it was to their home, which was no more than three blocks away. I'm sure they thought about that when they lied in bed at night. Something I found very interesting is that a lot of the descriptions of these bat squatch beings are actually very similar and resemble a creature from indigenous tradition, specifically the Ahul, which was named for its mournful crying as it would glide above the jungles. And of course, how could you forget Saram, which is an island in Indonesia where a lot of the locals there are terrified and continuously warn outsiders and locals about the horrific bat-like humanoid that allegedly resides on the island. They refer to this thing as the Orang Bati, and it roughly translates to man with wings. Now, interestingly, on October 27, 2009, two people were traveling down Viaduct Road in the small town of Pacific, Missouri. And so it was roughly around 11.30 p.m. as they would drive along, and something would suddenly catch their eye. There, soaring above them at about 150 feet in the air, was a figure that seemed to be the size and shape of a human being, but they were noticing that there was something so odd about this figure, and that's because its body appeared to be covered in this brown-gray hair. Something very strange to see because they were realizing there's no way this is a bird or a normal bat. And so as the two witnesses continue to drive down the road, they couldn't believe what they were saying and they keep looking over at it and they're thinking like, what is this? Now, despite its height, it managed to keep pace with their car, which by the way, they were going like 40 miles per hour. And as far as I know, there's no bat that large that goes that quickly that lives in North America. And so they watched in amazement as this large humanoid kind of just effortlessly soared through the sky following them, maintaining its position right above their vehicle for the entire duration. Now, these two individuals were completely shocked by what they had experienced and noticed that after some time, this thing kind of just stopped following them and it disappeared off into the night. Why it was following their vehicle or what plans that it had for these two, well, we'll never know. Now, right around the same time frame on March 18th, 2011, Boris was traveling at night through Butler County, Pennsylvania, right between the towns of Chicora and East Brady. Now, Butler County is located in Western Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Pittsburgh. It's a largely rural area with winding roads that cut through these dense forest and rolling hills. And on this particular stretch of road, there wasn't much around. I mean, maybe like the occasional farmhouse or gas station, but it's pretty desolate and there's a lot of woods and just wilderness around. And so as Boris drove along, his headlights began illuminating the dark road ahead and he notices something strange roughly 50 yards in front of him. And at first he couldn't quite make out what it was because 
it or they, whoever they were, seemed to be crouching down on the pavement. But now as this car gets closer, this thing kind of just rises up from a crouching position and Boris is like, oh crap, this isn't a regular animal and it's way too big to be a person because what he saw standing before him was this muscular, hairless beast he would describe with smooth, light brown skin. And as his car began to approach, he would obviously slow down and he noticed that this thing was massive and it stood taller than a nearby road sign putting it at probably around eight feet in height. But for Boris, the most shocking aspect of its appearance was its legs. Because unlike any animal that Boris had ever seen before, this thing's legs were jointed backwards, almost like those of a bird or a dinosaur. And as this thing turned to run off into the nearby tree line, he was able to catch a glimpse of something else that left him even more stunned. A set of long, bat-like wings that protruded from its back. And in the split second before this thing vanished into the woods, Boris noticed a few other very disturbing details. The thing had pointed ears on top of its head, and its arms ended in not hands, but in sharp, menacing claws. And perhaps the most disturbing of all, it seemed completely unfazed by Boris's presence. And now you also need to understand that Boris was a very rational man. I mean, this was a successful businessman, and so his reputation was on the line for sharing this kind of thing. He's not one to be prone to flights of fancy or even belief in the paranormal, but what he had just seen defied any logical explanation. He knew he had to tell somebody about this, but he also had to be careful going about it because he couldn't risk his reputation and having anyone think he was crazy. And so eventually he would reach out to a man named Stan Gordon, who is a very notable paranormal researcher who's based in Pennsylvania. And Stan at the time had been investigating strange sightings and encounters in the area at this point for decades. And so Boris hoped that he might have some insight into what this thing could have been. And so as the two would make contact, he would get a chance to actually tell him exactly what it was that he saw that night. Now, Stan, after hearing the account, was struck by how similar it sounded to reports that he had previously collected of strange winged humanoids that had been spotted in other parts of the world. Now, these creatures were often referred to as Mothman or the Owlman and were said to have similar features to what Boris described, the smooth skin, the claws, the wings, and the backwards jointed legs. But what really grabbed Stan's attention was the location of Boris's sighting. You see, most of the well-known encounters with these creatures had taken place in places like West Virginia or even the UK, areas with long histories of paranormal activity and strange creature sightings. I mean, not that Pennsylvania doesn't have those things, but for this particular context, it is a little different. But Butler County, Pennsylvania, I mean, this was not a place that typically came up in discussions of winged humanoids or even cryptozoological beasts. And yet here was a report from a very credible witness describing an encounter that matched up well with these other sightings. It was as if this creature, whatever it was, had somehow found its way to Pennsylvania from some far off homeland and was now roaming the back roads and forest of Butler County. So now for Boris, the encounter had completely shaken him to the core and he just began questioning everything he thought he knew about the world he lived in. He'd always been a skeptic when it came to that kind of stuff, but now that he had seen something with his own eyes that he simply couldn't explain away or just dismiss as a hallucination or a trick of the light or the case of a misidentification, he had to accept this newfound reality. He knew that most people would likely never believe him, or they would just simply try to come up with some mundane explanation to write him off and to explain what it was they had saw. But Boris knew what he had witnessed, and he could never unsee it. And unfortunately, because of his very successful business and his reputation, he was not able to ever share his name publicly and changed his name to a pseudonym in the report. Now, as far as the entities that Nathaniel, Bill, Jim, Mulholly, and his son, and everyone else, including Boris, that I mentioned in this Midwestern section, all saw and had experiences with, well, the identity of all those beings remains a mystery. In 1969, Jackie Hartley was only four years old at the time. 
and she was in the midst of traveling back from her aunt's house in London with her parents, and they had been driving for about half an hour through the countryside, and Jackie was in the back of the car when suddenly she heard this awful screeching scream. And so her, her mom and dad were in front kind of just chatting and having small talk, and they didn't hear anything, or at least they acted like they didn't hear anything. And it was kind of dusk at this point, and Jackie remembers looking out of the back window into the tree line, and she sees what she can only describe as a monster. And then it had bat wings, which had unfolded and stretched out before folding back up again, red eyes, and a kind of monster monkey face with a parrot's beak. The creature was about three feet in height, but to Jackie's four-year-old mind, it was terrifying. I mean, she had nightmares for weeks. She did not have a name for this thing in her vocabulary, and so she just called it the bat-winged monkey bird, as it seemed to be such a weird mixture of animals. Now, this creature had bat-like wings, which it unfolded and stretched out before folding them back up again, and its eyes glowed a menacing red. So seven years goes by, and when Jackie was 11, she would see this thing again. And it was late at night, and they were on their way home from Hastings, likely traveling through Roberts Bridge. And once again, Jackie spotted the monster from the back window of the car. The bat-winged monkey bird made its third appearance in 2006 when Jackie was an adult. And at 4.30 in the morning, Jackie was jolted awake by the same horrible screeching sound that had haunted her since childhood. I mean, once she heard this, it immediately brought back memories just flooding to her. So she knew what this was. Thinking someone was being murdered in the street, Jackie just jumped out of bed and ran to the window to look down, and she caught a glimpse of the same thing from her past as it flew around, and she instantly recognized it as the same thing that had terrorized her so many years ago. Now, despite the terrifying appearance, Jackie's bat-winged monkey bird never caused her any physical harm. However, the same cannot be said for the victims of a similar creature in the United States known as Bat Squatch. I mean, this monster has displayed predatory tendencies, both in action and intent, and has been known to attack those unfortunate enough to cross its path, or so we suspect. Now, Jackie's story remained untold for years until in 2007 when Carl Schuker, who was a researcher, received an email who had been forwarded to him by Jan Patience, who is the then editor of the British magazine Beyond and it was from Jackie detailing her bizarre experiences. Years ago, a Latina citizen was going about her day when she encountered something that would change her life forever. This woman, who wished to remain anonymous, saw what she described as a female humanoid creature standing at an imposing height of six feet tall. But its stature wasn't the only thing that caught this woman's attention, and as she looked closer, she realized this humanoid had striking red eyes that seemed to pierce right through her, and if that wasn't enough to terrify her, the Latina citizen noticed the creature possessed not one, but two pairs of hands. This particular entity had a small set of arms in addition to its wings, almost like some kind of genetic mix-up had occurred. The woman couldn't believe what she was seeing, and interestingly, this sighting somehow corroborates the other encounter that occurred back in 1998, where the logging truck was making its usual rounds, when suddenly out of nowhere, it would collide with a creature believed to be the Bat Squatch. When the loggers went to investigate the scene, that they too reported seeing a humanoid creature with multiple sets of appendages. And so I personally wonder that if there's any correlation between these two sightings, considering the striking similarities between the two, I mean, it certainly does raise some questions, especially considering the fact that you have multiple reports from witnesses who are both miles apart, who don't know each other at all, and they describe very similar unusual features. It just makes it a lot harder to ultimately dismiss all these as just tall tales. As far as the entity that Jackie and the Latina citizen saw, it just remains inconclusive. All right, so let's reflect a little bit on everything. There are these large flying hairy bat-like humanoids that have been clearly seen over the span of years by a multitude of eyewitnesses. Even more terrifying is they're not exclusive to the Pacific Northwest and not even the United States. And worst of all, these are only a small handful of the hundreds, if not thousands of sightings of similar beings 
all over the world. Now, the real question is, what are they? Are they bat squatch? Are they something else? Are they a genetic experiment from years ago gone wrong? Are they demonic beings? Are they a part of the Nephilim? I would love to know your thoughts and opinions on the matter. And because you guys made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below. Bat winged monkey bird. Try to say that like three times fast. Bat winged monkey bird, bat winged monkey bird. Blah, 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 blah. I can't even do it. So anyway, if you guys enjoy this kind of content, you know, where I talk about things of the strange, mysterious, and unexplained and the supernatural, then you should totally hit that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll see you all in the very next video.